But uh, welcome to the Harden BSD 2024 State of the Harden Union, a decade of Harden bits. We officially turn a Harden BSD officially turns a decade old this year, and uh, even though the work started in 2013, we'll talk about that in a little bit. First and foremost, I want to thank IO Active and uh, the Misses Lorraine uh, for supporting me in this in this venture. It's it's been a a long 10 years and uh, an exciting 10 years, and both with its challenges and with its, uh, with its successes. I want to thank you for, for attending, for an audience, uh, um, so I'm not uh, giving a presentation to an empty room awkwardly. Um, so thank you very much. And for anyone who contributes to any open source project, um, whether that's the BSDs, um, XZ <laughs> um, to any open source project because I own my own life to open source. Um, I wouldn't enjoy the 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 uh, the life that I have. Even even being married to my wife, there's a series of events that that led up to 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 today. And open source is is by and large a big part of that. So thank you very much. So who am I? I'm just a perpetually curious noob who ended up co-founding Harden BSD. Um, we're going to talk about the exploit mitigations and security hardening techniques that we've implemented. And we will uh, then talk about some of the human rights endeavors we've worked on and the lessons learned over the past 10 years. And we're going to try to predict the future. What was really cool is that uh, the Harden BSD uh, source repo on GitHub was created exactly 10 years to the day that we had the solar eclipse uh, this last April. So maybe we'll, maybe hopefully 10 years, we'll see uh, what interesting events happen. What is Harden BSD? It is a soft fork of FreeBSD that aims to provide the wider BSD community with a compassionate and human rights focused clean room re-implementation of the publicly documented bits of the, secure, of the GR security patch set for Linux. That's a mouthful. But essentially, the GR security patch set for Linux implements exploit mitigations and security hardening uh, techniques for Linux. And we aim to provide a, a, an open sourced uh, clean room re-implementation of that. We specialize in navigating the nexus between cybersecurity information security, and, cyber, and human rights. Our founding exploit mitigation is address space layout randomization. What that does is, without ASLR, an application will require to be deter, uh, loaded deterministically in memory. It requires that its functions, its symbols, its global variables to be loaded at specific addresses in, in, in memory. That means that if an attacker knows that there's a vulnerability in the application, the attacker can just go right to it because the attacker knows right where it is in memory. Uh, with ASLR, the, the application then is loaded anywhere in memory. The application will say, OK, I'll make do. I'll find where my main is. I'll find where printf is. I'll find where my global variables are. We're good. And um, so we started that work in 2013. Um, Harden, me, that was me and a dude from Oliver, a dude from Hungary named Oliver Pinter. And uh, we were working in separate code bases. He was working on it. We were working in different branches even. He was working on the stable branch at the time, and I was working on, on head, on main. And so in 2014 is when we combined our work into the collective known as Harden BSD. So we started this work in 2013 and, and finished it two years later in 2015. We use a delta-based approach uh, because that's the PAX model. We calculate six deltas. We calculate the, a delta for the execution base where the application itself is loaded, the stack, the main stack, and the per-thread stack to uh, non uh, uh, non-exclusive or non-fixed memory allocations 
and to non-fixed memory applications in, in the 32-bit address space and the virtual dynamic shared object. We failed at upstreaming this. FreeBSD ended up going a different way, um, not using a delta-based approach. And uh, that'll be provide some interesting statistics in the future, uh, uh, especially regarding memory fragmentation. I think this would provide some good uh, academic research as to the pros and cons between the different approaches, between a pure random approach and, and a delta-based approach. The deltas are calculated at exec VE time. PAC-ZIG FeeGuard is a related feature um, and uh, that we implemented, it, it prevents uh, brute, ASLR brute force uh, attacks. Some applications, when they crash, they are set to automatically respawn. And so an attacker can, can use that to their advantage. They can, they can try to figure out where uh, in memory things lie. And by doing so, that may cause the application to crash. After so many crashes in a window of period, we uh, suspend further further execution of that application. And uh, kind of like, kinda like a, a password brute force um, uh, uh, protections. You want to introduce a delay after so many times of, of fails. Pax no exec is our second exploit mitigation that we implemented. Um, there's in the Pax model, there's there's two parts to this. There's the there's the part at memory allocation time, at mmath time, and then there's the, the uh, at mprotect time, when you're transitioning a page or, or an allocation from maybe read-write to read and executable. Um, most commonly, uh, JITs do that, uh, just-in-time compilers. Pretty much if, ever, if a page has ever been marked as, as executable, it can never be marked as writable and vice versa. SafeStack is an exploit, a compiler-based exploit mitigation that comes from LLVM that we integrated. Um, there's two stacks, a stack for spillable data, an unsafe stack, and a safe stack for everything else. So eff effectively, we're trying to re uh, protect the return address pointer that's placed on the stack at every call. Um, uh, and so we put buffers and other spillable data in an unsafe stack. So if you do end up overflowing that buffer, you're just overflowing into another buffer. It's, a, it's somewhat contained. You still don't want that overflow to occur, of course, but at least you're not uh, uh, overflowing onto the return address pointer on the stack. It's applied only to applications. It's not currently suitable to be applied to uh, library code, whether that's static libraries, .a files, or uh, dynamic libraries, .so files. Um, in order to be applied for, to libraries, we need a better, more complete runtime linker, libc, and libthread integra integration. We started down that path a little bit, um, but uh, didn't make too much progress, and, and uh, our uh, efforts went elsewhere. It depends on ASLR and strict WXRX for efficacy, because if an adversary knows where that safe stack, or, or where the unsafe stack is in memory, they can just manipulate it and do other attacks. Um, and it requires WXRX because if they are able to write into those buffers into that unsafe stack, we don't want to make we don't want that that those buffers to be marked as executable. We don't want an attacker to be able to inject shellcode, mark it ex executable, and subsequently ex execute it. We are the first enterprise open source operating system to ship with safe stack. I believe, it's been a while since I've looked. We may still be the only one, but that, that may be out of date. Um, control flow integrity is trying to protect the forward edge, where say stack is trying to protect the backward edge. Control flow integrity, there's three uh, implementations, production impl implementations right now. There's the implementation for Microsoft uh, environments called Control Flow Guard. And there's the LVM implementation, 
and uh, the GR security and PAX implementation. They're, they differ in granularity. Um, Control Flow Guard is the least granular or the most coarse grained. LVM is kind of a middle between uh, uh, Control Flow Guard and PAX Wrap. PAX Wrap is, is very um, fine grained and is the ideal that we strive for. Um, but we can't implement or import wrap into hardened BSD, one, because it's GPL v3, and we have a policy not to import any new GPL code into base, and two, it's patented. We, we don't have the money to pay a single developer, let, let alone um, ro uh, patent royalties. So PAX wrap is out for us, and Microsoft, you know, we're a BSD, not Windows, so LVM CFI it is. Um, and it only protects the forward edge. In order to integrate CFI, we need to uh, embrace a more complete LVM compiler toolchain. So FreeBSD has a source uh, uh, knob that allows you to build with a complete uh, LVM bin utils. Uh, we're early adopters of that. Um, FreeBSD still hasn't enabled it, and I'm, they have a, an experimental run, a bug open to, um, to track the ability for FreeBSD to uh, enable it by default. And I think the end goal is to switch to a complete LVM compiler toolchain. Right now we apply CFI only to applications, um, but applying uh, CFI across the shared object boundary or cross DSO CFI is in the works. I've been working on it slowly since 2016, but it is, it is a beast to try to, to, try to get working, um, especially with regards to ports. In order to build with CFI, you have to build with LTO and we build uh, pretty much all of the base user land with LTO, and until recently even libc, so we build all libraries with LTO, static and, and, and shared. But recently we had to disable LTO for libc because of recent changes in, in uh, FreeBSD, and I still have some gaps of knowledge to be able to reapply uh, CFI to libc. And there's some changes with the CSU and the, the dan there's a dance between the CSU, libc, and libthr, and the RTLD, the runtime linker, and I'm, I still have some gaps of knowledge with that dance. So hopefully one day we'll, we'll get uh, LTO reapplied, link time optimization reapplied to libc, um, and that's in the works. Um, but in order to land cross DSO CFI, you're gonna have you're gonna need a lot of memory. You know, for your most basic system, you're looking at a minimum 32 gigs. So in order to land uh, cross DSO CFI, this is what we need. Um, the DTrace uh, tools um, and related tools need to be taught the LVM IR bitcode object file format, because when you build with LTO, the LVM compiler toolchain spits out intermediate object files that are in the LVM IR format rather than ELF. And CTF merge and CTF convert don't understand LVM IR. So those need to be taught LVM IR. We need a more complete runtime linker integration with, uh, with the CFI compiler runtime uh, so that uh, we can get more fine-grained um, uh, uh, application of CFI across the shared object, uh, the DSO boundary. What would be really cool is if we could introduce a new sysint, uh, a new image activator, and a new runtime linker to, to directly execute LVMIR object files um, as if uh, as we do with ELF today. Um, so that we can completely skip the LVMIR to ELF transition. Um, 
And so that would, that would definitely help us out uh, in the long run. Um, I need to learn uh, LVM, IR, and compiler internals. Um, I flunked out of university, so I don't have any you know, uh, formal compiler study. So I'm kind of coming from this, uh, coming at this from the rear. Um, uh, so there's, there's a lot of gaps of knowledge that I need to fulfill in order to land this. Um, so we, we, we do have non-cross DSL-CFI uh, shipped in 14 stable and 15 current, but we're looking to land cross DSL-CFI. The runtime linker, uh, we've hardened uh, that quite a bit, and that's been kind of a big pain point because that hardening is enabled by default. Effectively, we, dis we distrust the environment. So all the LD library path, LD preload, uh, LD library FDs, um, LD trace, there's quite a few LD environment variables that, that will constrain or change how the runtime linker performs. Um, we distrust all of that by default. So you can't do LD preload, you can't specify a custom uh, library path. Um, and so that, that mitigates abuse of, of the environment and, and abuse of the runtime linker specifically. Um, that has, has shown to be a good technique for mitigating uh, um, uh, existing malware like the, the recent eBerry um, malware attack um, that hit like what, 40,000 or something Linux in FreeBSD servers. Um, they abused LD preload there. Trusted path execution, um, pretty much that. We're experimenting with it. Um, we just upstreamed a few patches to, to support FreeBSD and hardened BSD. In the future, I would like to see something akin to Kali um, with all the uh, a live build of hardened BSD that has all the offensive tooling built in or baked in. So with our human rights endeavors, we started focusing on human rights efforts in 2018. I had the opportunity to mentor two interns, interns and um, I tend to think that they, they mentored me more than I mentored them. They taught me a lot about the, the human aspect of technology. Because before, before this period, I was, all, I was mostly just focused on the tech re-implementing GR security. But I wasn't really focused more on the human side of things. And te technology is meant to serve us as humans. It is, uh, it is meant to allow us to communicate and to share. Um, and so our interns in 2018, um, for the company that I worked for, we focused on that nexus between cybersecurity and human rights. We had the opportunity to uh, help uh, some, some students in Venezuela, some families in Venezuela, get reconnected after the, the government had uh, caused a blockade of certain internet resources. And to, to see the excitement in, in these families, uh, 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 that these families conveyed, that they're able to communicate uh, with their families, to be able to still um, maintain a line of commu communication with the, those people that they love and cherish, um, even in a hostile environment. Um, there was uh, another um, group of people that I, that I helped out um, uh, across, uh, across the ocean that they lived in, a, in an area of religious oppression and um, those openly practicing their religion were jailed, were tortured, were sent to labor camps um, and otherwise oppressed. And so trying to communicate 
between groups, between families, between individuals can be hard in those and challenging in those times. Um, so we helped um, deploy an infrastructure, communications infrastructure, that allowed um, these people to stand up their own infrastructure, their own hard and BSD infrastructure, um, completely behind Tor. So we provide Tor uh, onion and endpoint service nodes for all of our public infrastructure. Um, that allows someone to go from zero to development to staging to production and everything in between um, fully behind Tor. That meant that their adversaries did not know even the very technologies that they were using that kept this populace safe. So we specialize in deployments in hostile environments that are both technologically hostile, meaning malware that likes to spread, and hostile to human life. We make sure that we provide those services in which people can do things that, that permit and provide uh, access and capabilities for people to do things in hostile environments and remain safe. We also provide some additional services like a Tor Snowflake relay. Um, so we, 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 we make large use of the, Tor no, to, of the Tor network, which puts some, uh, some load on the Tor network. And we try to give back what we can we run a Tor Snowflake Relay. We uh, were on the advisory board uh, for, the, for Emerald Onion, which is a high-speed um, encrypted transit provider. They run um, Tor exit nodes and middle relays and you know, everything. Um, and when you, if Tor chooses Emerald Onion as your exit node, if you're going to GitHub, you're going directly to GitHub because they do uh, peering at IXPs, um, internet exchange points. So they peer directly with providers so that when you're going from Tor to something out on the public internet, chances are if you're going through Emerald Onion, you might be going there directly from Emerald Onion. And you're not going through an extra hop over the internet or one or more extra hops. At the end of the day, we want to support at-risk and underserved populaces, those who have uh, a good desire to uh, maintain and establish communications and relationships, but are generally not able to. Our next major goal, um, and I'm really excited for the Batman talk later today, is a wireless mesh network that um, is modeled after the NICE mesh, or NYC, New York City mesh network. So we would have um, mesh network nodes that can route in intermesh you know, with their other peers. Those nodes that, uh, that provide outbound internet access, they would route everything through Tor. And, uh, um, and uh, the links between the, the mesh nodes um, would be encrypted using either WireGuard or IPsec or OpenVPN with DCO. Um, and uh, I think that would help um, provide a, a pretty resilient network uh, to help tackle censorship and surveillance issues. We want to expand beyond Tor for access to our um, uh, repos and to our resources. Um, Radical, we're experimenting with that, like I said. Um, Radical is, is kind of at an early stage and is working towards supporting repos that, are, that have a bit of a longer history. You know, we're not, you know, neither FreeBSD nor HardenBSD has, has the largest repos ever, you know. Um, I know of a repo that is 600 gigs in size, 
Um, and uh, um, uh, whereas HardenBSD is like two gigs in size. Um, Radicals right now is more suited for smaller repos, um, but they're working towards um, being able to support larger repos. Lessons learned of the last 10 years. Um, compassionate collaboration is key. Um, there are people who, you know, I have a lot of blind spots. I grew up in a, in a, in a US culture. I am very ignorant of, of many different cultures. And what I can, the, the best that I can do is be compassionate towards others and say, what can I do to ease your burden? Because at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're here for, is to make each other's burdens light, allow each other to communicate securely and uh, affordably. Volunteers come and go. We, early on in the project, we experimented with having LibreSSL in base. And that was early on in LibreSSL's life, too. And the maintainer, who was one person, just kind of got burned out on it. And we ended up switching back to OpenSSL in the base uh, as the default crypto library in base, just because it was, it was too much. So when we take on a new project, especially in the source tree, we want to make sure that there's redundancy in, in that project maintainership that we have a long-term game plan. We want to focus on the right things because there's only so many hours in a day. A lot of open source seems to be focused on funding, 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 as if that's kind of a magical answer. I, I'm really grateful for the funding that we have in Harden BSD um, and for those that, that contribute, you know, even we have a contributor that, that, that contributes $2 and that means all, a lot to me. Um, but at the end of the day, also, it's not just about the dollars and cents, it's about the time. Because my dogs still need to be taken out for a walk. I still need to date my wife on occasion, and she would like that too. Um, and funding doesn't change that. So I need to make sure that my time is allocated appropriately. Um, and that we focus on the things that, that mean the most to us. And that is those human relationships. Allowing others to communicate and to maintain and establish relationships in hostile, on, hostile environments. Some long-term problems that we have is support for alternative architectures. You know, with ARM64 and RISC-V, right now you have all these SBCs that require one-off builds because they have, they use U-Boot and require custom changes to U-Boot. And so all of these images have to be specific for that SBC or specific for that device. We don't have the bandwidth for that. We don't have the compute for that, or even the disk space for that. So supporting alternative architectures, um, we're only gonna support architectures for which we as a project have the hardware for. And if you want a, a system, an ARM64 system that boots normal UFI, just like your AMD64 system, just plug in any USB stick that has a UEFI bootloader, and there you go. ARM64 doesn't have that unless you're Mac hardware, or unless you're the Ampere Ultras, which are thousands upon thousands of dollars. You have to have a lot of money for even the most basic of technologies with these alternative architectures. We face a leaky kernel, um, the current protecting the kernel from local attacks is always gonna be an issue. Building ports, uh, building packages is, is tough because it takes about two weeks for us to build one repo. And we have uh, three, three supported branches um, 
15 current, 14 stable, and 13 stable. So we have to have a minimum if we want uh, at least one build per month, one package build per month for, for an architecture, we need to have at least one server for that, archi for that architecture and branch. Um, so um, building packages just is a headache um, from a time management perspective. LVM LTO instability. There's issues with LVM in base and ports that are at a lower version. Um, in 15 current, we have LVM 18 in base. And uh, some ports say I require uh, LVM 15 to build. And so if we have a, sh a, a, a static um, library, a .a file that includes uh, object files that are LVMI or big code built by LVM 18 in base, but the port is set at LVM 15, that port is gonna fail to build. So ports always has to mirror, uh, the minimum version of ports has to mirror the exact version or major, major version of LVM in base um, because of that ABI instability. Again, memory requirements are huge for LTO. Um, building packages for cross DSL CFI um, haven't been able to do that yet successfully, um, partially because of memory requirements. And we face issues with projects that carry human rights impact changes that that have that that have a negative, um, a net negative effect on human rights. There was a project that re relatively recently prohibited uh, dot onion lookups. Um, and, uh, and so people were left unable to update their package, uh, their packages because this project is also a vendor dependency in, in, in package, in PKG. And so since our, in those cases, those users would be uh, reaching out to our Onion Tor Onion services to get their packages, suddenly they weren't able to update because the, the open source project had pr introduced a prohibition on DNS lookups for the dot .onion uh, pseudo TLD. So we have to now maintain patches for the rest of time to re-enable or to get around that prohibition. Um, and so that's, it's an ever-changing landscape, I guess. Mirroring package re repos, um, each repo is about 75 gigs in size. We have to store it twice. Um, uh, and update a sim link when, when after we sync a new, re, a new package build. Um, and so mirroring that is gonna take a lot of work, especially we need a, 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 a GeoDNS and we need the infrastructure for that. And the GeoDNS part costs money, money we don't have, and the infrastructure bit as well. Usually you want a CDN for package mirrors and CDNs cost money. HardenBSD's future looks very bright given our focus on human rights. Um, FreeBSD has done a really good job these past few years in, in uh, putting a focus on exploit mitigations and security hardening techniques. I'm really excited for the Cherry project. Um, but there's always gonna need, uh, there's always gonna be a space for HardenBSD because of the work that we do in human rights and because we follow the GR security and PACS model. Um, there's some desire for CFI in the kernel, which I'm slowly working on uh, in the same feature branch as the cross DSO CFI work. A few years ago, uh, Apple released this, uh, uh, their, their um, inaugural uh, post, their first post on their security blog was how they're hardening 
the, their kernel uh, allocator, their kernel memory allocator. And I would like us to go that route um, uh, to, to start hardening the kernel. Um, there is a, uh, a member of the HardenBSD community who is researching hardening and buffs specifically, and we're going to kind of start, start there um, for, for hardening kernel, kernel ABI. We want to support and assist women in tech in similar uh, movements and organizations. There's, I, I look at this room and we're all mainly, you know, seemingly male or of, you know, that, you know. So I want us as a community to, to boost those and empower those in minority positions. I want us to see, I want this film to be, this, this room to be filled with much more diversity, women in tech, LGBTQIA+, everything. I would love to see, to uplift uh, people in, in at-risk and underserved populaces. We would love to mentor junior developers and security engineers. If, you, if, you, if operating systems development and security engineering seem interesting to you, um, reach out to us. Um, we, at the end of the day, we want to carry a tangible, positive impact on human lives and rights. Um, so I want to say thank you for coming. Um, do I? I just have a couple minutes. Well, technically, I'm over because we started late. But anyone have any questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming.